Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies, shall we praise the Lord for allowing us the time to come to an understanding of what he would have us to know and that which we must do <clears throat> in our lives so that our characters may become more like his. May we ask for his help and for that of his spirit today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, there is much we yet need to learn. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your loving kindness. Most of all, we thank you for the Sabbath day where the cares of this world may be set aside, where we may join with other like-minded believers so that our characters may be more fully developed, so that we may more correctly show the message that you would have shown to this earth at the end of this time. Father, may the words that are said be yours, not mine. May your direction be clear. We ask, Father, not only for your blessing, but for your guidance and your direction. May your spirit attend us. May your angels be with us as well. Help us so that we may recognize the sin that has been within our lives and more recognize our great need of you so that the message that you would have given may be clear to all of those with whom we come in contact. For this, Father, we thank you. For this opportunity, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, we're going to go over a couple of things from the close of last week's meeting. We're going to complete this document, go into another one briefly. Because there's quite a bit for us to look at and for us to understand. Do not watch others to pick at their faults or expose their errors. Do not catch hold of isolated ideas and make them a test, criticizing others whose practice may not agree with your opinion. But study the subject broadly and deeply and seek to bring your own ideas and practices into harmony with the principles of Christian temperance. This admonition is given to us individually. This admonition is also given to us as a movement. We are not to be picking at the words and the perceived faults of others. For who knows if we have faults even more grievous than theirs. <clears throat> Educate here, others. Go ahead. Here, the context is also diet, right? But it, but it does. The principles do uh, apply as you you know you bring them more broadly, right? But often in the area of diet, there are ideas that people have that they think are the most important idea that everybody needs to practice that. But often they are neglecting other areas of health, and um. So the, you know, and, and this creates, this creates a problem because if, if we can just practice what we understand, uh, we can be an example, but if we're, we're constantly critical of others, um, it actually brings a reproach to the health message. And, and this is true in every area. But if we are bringing <clears throat> and continuing to expose what we perceive as the faults of others, do we not bring a reproach upon the entire message of the third angel? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now, educate others to better habits by the power of your own example. 
If we move from principle in these things, as if Christian reformers, we educate our own taste and bring our diet into harmony with the original plan. We shall not only be benefited ourselves, but we shall exert an influence upon others by which God will be pleased and will be honored. There is something better to talk about than the faults and weaknesses of others. Talk of God and his wonderful works. Study into the manifestations of his love and wisdom in all the works of nature. Study that marvelous organism, the human system, and the laws by which it is governed. Those who perceive the evidence of God's love, who understand something of the wisdom and the benefits, beneficence of his laws and the blessings that result from obedience, will come to regard their duties and obligations from an altogether different point of view from that of a hard duty. Instead of looking upon an observance of the laws of health as a matter of sacrifice or self-denial, they will regard it as it really is an inestimable blessing. <clears throat> there is work to be done in the cause of reform, stern, earnest work. Those who engage in it heartily will meet perplexities and difficulties. Yet none should be discouraged because of this or because of their efforts. The prophet says of one characteristic of Christ, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth. Isaiah 42, 4. Then let not his followers talk of failure or discouragement, but persevere, remembering the price paid to rescue man, that he might not perish, but have eternal life. We cannot be too earnest in seeking to raise the fallen and to shield the weak from temptation. Our human hands are feeble, but we have an unfailing helper. We must not forget that the arm of Christ can reach to the very depths of human woe and degradation. He can enable us to conquer even the terrible demon of appetite. Now, this next document, when I went through this, I asked myself if this document was not a letter to the movement. We're going to look at a little bit of this. We're also going to look at something else today. So this was written to Brother Atwood and Pratt, two brothers that she felt impressed and was led to write to. <clears throat> Dear Brother and Atwood and Pratt, <clears throat> I have a few words to say to you, my brethren, in reference to the subject we were recently conversing about. I have had no conversation with Brother Rogers, for I have felt that it is best for those who are at variance to follow Bible directions. The Savior has said, if thou bring the gift, thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother, Matthew 18, 5. This kind of work requires the grace of Christ in the heart. There is alienation and division where none should exist. Among those who profess to be the children of God, and the reason for this is that men are hearers, readers of the word of Christ but not doers. How does, does this statement apply to what we were studying last night? How 
How can we give a message to the world if we are not in unity within the movement? <clears throat> yeah, and of course, how we come into unity is first we have to be connected with Christ. But if we're connected with Christ, we can't be at variance. We can't be in conflict. And, and so that requires conversion and repentance, confession and repentance. We have to follow the counsel of Matthew 18. Right. <clears throat> One of the things that I always, I, I have to consider, especially when we are looking at, at a situation like this, for us to be connected to Christ, we are to be connected fully and completely, always connected. For me, it's very much like an electrical circuit. In order for a circuit to function, the circuit must be grounded. But to have full power, you're going to have to have your wires connected in such a way so that you are receiving your power from the source. If we are choosing not to be grounded, not to study, not to pray, not to consider the words, <clears throat> then how are we ever going to be able to share? Now, if we're not connected to the source, how are we ever going to receive light and power from on high? Well, it just short out. Exactly. And what happens when it shorts out? That's it. It's dead. I mean, it's... Darkness. Darkness, right. It physically breaks the connection. Exactly. There's a lot of situations that can occur. Now, <clears throat> last week when we came to assemble together, my internet was down. We didn't know why. I spent time last week talking with the provider. And they kept telling me that a piece of equipment had failed. But there was something in the way that they approached it where I was led to believe that there was something more going on. I placed a telephone call. <clears throat> I was told that if this was a problem on the side of, of the provider, that this would be corrected at no charge. They sent a man out. They looked at everything assuming that I didn't know what I was talking about. And this is after multiple times, multiple calls. Finally, the technician chose to go up on top of the pole where the connections were made. <clears throat> and he found that the problem was because of squirrels had gnawed at the cables. So the connection had been broken. Sometimes our connection with Christ can get broken. We might entertain an idea. We might entertain something that is not 
fully in agreement with our other brothers and sisters. We might have a connection that is broken. Now, as it has happened, we have had connections that have broken. On December 6th, a connection was broken because others did not wish to study deeply into things that had been studied before. Over the last several months, we've had others that have criticized. They've criticized individuals. <clears throat> they have decided, we really don't want to hear what you have to say. They have chosen to have this disconnect. Our situation here is that we are not to choose to have a disconnect. We are to study, consider, and apply so that our connection with Christ, this vital connection that we have, may become strong, living, and vibrant. <clears throat> How much suffering might be prevented if those who claim to know and believe the truth would practice the, its precepts? Is this not what we are here to do today, brothers and sisters? Are we not here to practice exactly what Father Miller laid out before us, that when we don't understand something, we are to bring every verse on this topic together. In living out the lessons of Jesus, we make it manifest that we are not careless, inattentive, unfruitful hearers of the word. If those who claim to be followers of Christ were only obedient to the truth, the door that is now open, where Satan enters to wound and bruise the soul, would be closed. How careful we should be not to offend one of the little ones that belong to God. The Savior said, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Matthew 18, 14. <clears throat> Let every member of the church try to save the souls of others and not seek to discourage or destroy them through criticism or evil reports. How many and how great evils would be extinguished in the church if men would follow Christ's rule of dealing with the erring instead of following the impulses, and the passions of their unsanctified hearts. If matters of difficulty between brethren are not laid open to others, but frankly spoken of between themselves in the spirit of Christian love, the difficulty would in nearly every case be healed <clears throat> and the offending brother won. Misunderstandings have arisen that have been thus explained. In Christian tenderness, and the breach has been healed. This paragraph lays out for us directly the upper room experience. If we are not willing to have the upper room experience, how can we ever expect for the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit? When brethren come together in harmony with the directions of Christ, Jesus himself is a witness to the scene, and the whole universe looks with intense interest upon those who not only believe, 
but do the words of Christ. The Spirit of God will move upon the heart of him who has erred when Christ's words are carried out. And the one at fault will be convicted of his error. <clears throat> but if he is too proud, too self-sufficient to confess his mistake and heal the wrong, other steps are to be taken in order to follow out the complete directions of the word. But if he will not hear thee in the private interview, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Matthew 18, 16. The matter of difficulty is to be confined to as small a number as possible, but two or three <clears throat> are to labor with the one who is in error. They should not only talk with him, but bow in prayer and with humble hearts seek the Lord. One of the things that we are called upon to be is a witness for Christ. How can we be a witness if we have not an experience? The way that this was first asked of me, how could you offer testimony about an accident if you have never seen the accident? In this movement, <clears throat> over the last many years, there have been many times that I have been led to question some of those that were seen as being bright and shining lights and leaders. In a small group session, where Emiliano was presenting, there were specific items that he stated where I was led to question what he had to say. Emiliano's direct comment back was, we'll get into that after we break bread. Yet, as soon as the meal was over, Emiliano looked around and said, I must attend to my family, therefore I must leave. Have a happy Sabbath. And he left. Another party that I greatly respected had made a comment during another Sabbath session. And his comment had a single witness. Now, as he had taught in the past that we are to establish these things by the witness of two or three, I asked him directly in front of others, where is your second witness to this point? His comment to me was very specific. I knew I was going to get caught on this. I'll have to answer your question later. To this day, he has not answered the question. Now, a third situation had occurred. This had to deal with Don Frost. Don was giving a presentation. There were points in his presentation that were at odds with what had been presented by others within the movement. On that Sabbath, I went to him. I asked him very directly why. 
His comment to me is that <clears throat> we are about to enter the ordinance of humility. We are about to have communion together. Let us talk of this later. At that time, I offered to pray with him. And we did. We never did talk of it later. He would not speak of it further. Now, the first two examples are those that are no longer within this movement. One has decided that the movement specifically within the Adventist church is completely wrong. The second made the decision that his salvation was found only within the corporate church. And he agreed to never again speak of the seven times of Leviticus 26, never again to speak of the charts, never again to address these things as being important for the movement or the church. <clears throat> Don Frost has aligned himself with others. It wasn't long after that that I received a telephone call <clears throat> from the lady that was hosting the meetings. Her comment to me was, Find another place to worship. For you do not believe in the third angel's message. And this is a third angel's message house. Come not upon my door any further. At this point... We are going to find many times that we will offer a message, a message of hope, a message of restoration, a message of salvation, and these messages will be rejected. We may find this occurring within the movement itself. How are we to address this when these things occur? What directions are we being given? Are we not to praise God for helping us and revealing to us those things in our own lives that are going to need to be corrected? <clears throat> We must put the admonition of the, of the Savior into practice. If we will not follow his words, then whose words are we following? And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, if he persists in his unreasonable course and will not be corrected, then there is only one more step to be taken, and that is a very sorrowful one. Let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Matthew eighteen seventeen. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever shall thou bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, 18. When every specification in which Christ has given has been carried out in true Christian spirit, then and only heaven ratifies the decision of the church, because its members have the mind of Christ, as do and do as he would were he upon the earth. 
Consider for a moment Matthew 18, 18. Numerically, here we have a doubling. Therefore, do we not have a representation of the second angel's message? There were times when the disciples were cast out of the church. Was the church at that time correct in doing so? What say you? Question again. Go ahead. No. Can you raise that question again, please? Sure. There were many times that the disciples were cast out of the church of their time. Was the church correct in casting the disciples out? That's a tricky question. Why? Well, because uh, the church as a whole didn't have a good understanding of what the message actually was. And they cast them out because of their lack of understanding. Okay. So to answer the question, was the church right in casting them out at that time? I'd have to say no. But they okay. also didn't have the understanding. And that's why they cast them out. So, so, you know, it's a kind of a tricky question. Were the leaders of the movement correct on December 6th in choosing to cast out those that disagreed with them? Absolutely not. I believe that's right in line with what you just said. Because they did not have the understanding of the message. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, again, it, it, it's, they're actually um, paralleling um, Jews in the time of uh, Christ. Right. Brethren, it must be made manifest that we are not only Bible readers, but also doers of the words of Christ. Those who fully trust in the Lord Jesus will be obedient children and will have guidance from above. The mind and the will of God are made plain in the living oracles. What a promise this is. If we are not only Bible readers, but also doers of the words of Christ. <clears throat> we are not just to eat of the word. We are to put the word into practice. We are not just to read Miller's rules. We are to put it into practice. We are not just to read the words of Sister White, but we are to have these items in practice in our very lives. This is why the light that we have been given is so very important at this time. Now, We're going to shift to testimony number 27. <clears throat> the Lord gave Jeremiah a message of reproof to bear to the people, charging them with the continual rejection of God's counsel, saying, I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearken not unto me. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way and amend your doings and go not after other gods to serve them 
and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you and to your fathers. See Jeremiah 35, 14 and 15. God pled with them not to provoke him to anger with the work of their hands and their hearts, but they hearkened not. Jeremiah then predicted the captivity of the Jews and their punishment for not heeding the word of the Lord. The Chaldeans were to be used as the instrument by which God would chastise his disobedient people. Their punishment was to be in proportion to their intelligence and the warnings that they had despised. God had long delayed his judgments because of his unwillingness to humiliate his chosen people. But now he would visit his displeasure upon them as a last effort to check them in their evil course. <clears throat> their punishment was to be in proportion to their intelligence. Their punishment was to be in proportion to the light that had been received. Does this apply with what we've seen with the Omega? Does this apply with what we are seeing with what's been going on within the church itself? Does this apply to us? In these days, he has instituted no new plan to preserve the purity of his people. He entreats the erring ones who profess his name to repent and turn from their evil ways in the same manner that he did of old. He predicts the dangers before them by the mouth of his chosen servants now as then. He sounds his note of warning and reproves sin just as faithfully as in the days of Jeremiah. But the Israel of our time have the same temptations to scorn reproof and to hate counsel as did ancient Israel. They too often turn a deaf ear to the words that God has given his servants for the benefit of those who profess the truth. Though the Lord in mercy withholds for a time the retribution of their sin. As in the days of Jeremiah, he will not always stay his hand, but will visit iniquity with righteous judgment. Is this not the time period that we find ourselves in now? Are we not seeing this occurring before our very eyes? The Lord commanded Jeremiah to stand in the court of the Lord's house and to speak unto all the people of Judah who came there to worship these things which he would give him to speak, diminishing not a word, that they might hearken and turn from their evil ways. Then God would repent of the punishment which he had proposed to do unto them because of their wickedness. The unwillingness of the Lord to chastise his erring people is here vividly shown. He stays his judgment. He pleads with them to return to their allegiance. Where else do we find a commandment where a prophet is to stand in the court of the Lord's house and to speak to the people that have come there to worship? What other parallel can we make here?
Is this a difficult question? Well, you're asking, is there another example of this in the Bible? Yes. I can't, I can't think of a specific one. What about Ezekiel 9? Do we not accept that as a movement, we are to take the message to first the house of God starting at his temple? Well, well, in Ezekiel nine, I mean, it's it's a little bit different because it's it's quite symbolic. Of course, it is. Yeah. So, because um, you know that there's going to be uh, the the man with the writer's inkhorn that's going to put a mark upon those that sigh and cry for the abominations. That are done but is that them. not the position of the movement? that there are those that are going to sigh and cry about the abominations that are in the land? Mm -hmm. Are these not those that are then found righteous by their faith because they recognize the abominations that have been ongoing? Mm -hmm. Though I think we often misapply this because we look at the abominations as the things happening in the church or the things happening in the world, and then and, and that's, not, that's not wrong. But we sort of pick and choose what we think the abominations are. It's whatever we're not doing. So those that really sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the midst thereof, uh, these are people that have a Christ-like character. Right. These are those that are found righteous by their faith. Re regarding the six men here, we know that one of them has the right writer's ink cord. There isn't seven men here. There's six men. So there's five that have slaughter weapons and one that has an ink horn, correct? Right. And the five represent what? Well, the five wise. Right. And the total number of six represent? I don't know. Six being the number of man, is this not a message of God given through men to men? Yeah, I'm not sure that's why there's six here, though. Okay. He brought them out of bondage that they might faithfully serve himself, the only true and living God. But they had wandered into idolatry. They had slighted the warnings given them by his prophets. Yet he defers his chastisement to give them one more opportunity to repent and avert the retribution for their sin. Uh, just to get back to what we were talking about. So we know that Ezekiel... Uh, Chapter 9, the vision begins in Ezekiel 8. Correct. And it's going to be the sixth year, the sixth month, of the fifth day of the month. It's almost 666. And so this, this here represents, the six would represent uh, the Sunday Law Crisis. Okay. And we know that in this story, it's going to move to the sixth day of the sixth month. And this vision does. That is the description of this vision and what happens. So an actual day will pass. So he will then be on the sixth day of the sixth month of the sixth year. Uh, when he does that uh, depiction of uh, uh, Zedekiah uh, trying to escape. Okay. Right. So, so that's, I think, why the number six is there. I mean, it is the number of a man. But I think it really has to do with the Sunday law. But anyway, that's sort of beside what we're talking about. No, that's a good point, though. 
<clears throat> Through his chosen prophet, he now sends them a clear and positive warning and lays before them the only course by which they can escape the punishment which they deserve. <clears throat> this is a full repentance of their sin and a turning from the evil of their ways. We note that there was a period of 70 years that was a time of judgment upon the people. That period of 70 years, one of those periods of 70 years was to allow the land to rest for all of the Sabbaths that it had not rested, right? <coughs> yeah, specifically the sabbatical years that it didn't rest. We are yet again bearing the brunt of the fact that not only has the land not rested, we have not truly accepted the Sabbath rest that has been provided and thereby becoming more righteous by faith in what Christ is able to do. This is why we are working through these studies to come to a clearer understanding of what righteousness by faith really means. The Lord commanded Jeremiah to say to the people, thus saith the Lord, if ye will not hearken unto me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. <clears throat> then I will make the house like Shiloh, and I will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. They understood this reference to Shiloh and the time when the Philistines overcame Israel and the ark of God was taken. She's being very direct here. Was there a difficulty for them to understand the reference to Shiloh in comparison with the Savior's words of eat my flesh and drink my blood? For how did <clears throat> those that heard that admonition respond at that time to the Savior? Did they not say, for this is an hard hearing, who can hear it? Yeah, that was it. The sin of Eli was in passing lightly over the iniquity of his sons who were occupying sacred offices. Symbolically, who does Eli represent here? The church. Okay. <clears throat> can, he, can Eli also represent some within the movement at this time? Well, yeah. If we choose not to study, if we choose not to compare things line upon line with our brothers and sisters, if we choose not to accept the admonitions as given 
as applying to ourselves? Are we not choosing then to hold on to our own sins? The neglect of the father to reprove and restrain his sons brought upon Israel a fearful calamity. The sons of Eli were slain. Eli himself lost his life. The ark of God was taken from Israel and 30,000 of their people were slain. <clears throat> not 300, not 30, but 30,000. All this was because sin was lightly regarded and allowed to remain in their midst. What a lesson is this to men holding responsible positions in the church of God. It adjures them to faithfully remove the wrongs that dishonor the cause of truth. Israel thought in the days of Samuel that the presence of the ark containing the commandments of God would gain them the victory over the Philistines, whether or not they repented of their wicked works. Just so the Jews in Jeremiah's time believed that the divinely appointed services of the temple were being strictly observed and would preserve them from the just punishment of their evil course. <clears throat> just like those today that view the church as their method of salvation. Where is our salvation to be found? Is it not found in Jesus Christ alone? Amen. If this is indeed the case, how can we place our trust in a church or in man for our salvation? <clears throat> Are we to enter into a, conf a confessional confessing to a man the things that are occurring within our lives? Or are we to bow before God, confessing to him the iniquity of our hearts? Is man our intercessor before God? I thought we were our own intercessor. Well, actually, it's Christ that's the intercessor. And we're the only ones that can actually do this. We have to we have to be involved in this to 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 make the request to show me understanding or to show me what's the problem. Okay. We can't ask some guy to ask us or ask God for us, but we do. Nope. <laughs> we, there we, are, ask, we ask our brother and our brother Christ. There are many that choose to go before a man. <clears throat> a creation of the almighty and seek absolution from the creation and not from the creator what a mistake this is the same danger exists today among that people who profess to be the repository of god's law the same danger exists today among those who profess to be of the movement. They are too apt to flatter themselves that the regard in which they hold the commandments should preserve them from the power of divine justice. <clears throat> they refuse to be reproved of evil. They refuse to be reproved of criticizing others. And they blame God's servants with being too zealous in putting sin out of the camp. A sin-hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from all iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his word 
will bring as serious consequences upon God's people today as did the same sin upon ancient Israel. <clears throat> there is a limit beyond which he will no longer delay his judgments. The correction of God through his chosen instruments cannot be disregarded with impunity. The desolation of Jerusalem stands as a solemn warning before the eyes of modern Israel. We have much to consider, brothers and sisters. We have much yet to learn in order to know what it truly means to become righteous by faith. <clears throat> when the priests and the people heard the message that Jeremiah delivered to them in the name of the Lord, they were very angry and declared that he should die. They were boisterous in their denunciations of him crying, why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Thus was the message of God despised, and the servant with whom he entrusted it threatened with death. <clears throat> the priests the unfaithful prophets and all the people turned in wrath upon him who would not speak to them smooth things and prophesy deceit. <clears throat> the priests, the, unpro the unfaithful prophets, and all the people. Is this not a threefold union against the message of God? What do you see here? The unfaltering servants of God have usually suffered the bitterest persecution from false teachers of religion. The more we stand for the word of God, the more we accept and study according to the instructions that God has offered, the more we speak out against that which we are seeing occurring, the more persecution will come upon us. But the true prophets will ever prefer reproach and even death rather than unfaithfulness to God. <clears throat> the infinite eye is upon the instruments of divine reproof, and they bear a, bear a heavy responsibility. <clears throat> but God regards the injury done to them through misrepresentation, through falsehood, or abuse, the same as though it was done unto himself, and he will punish accordingly. What does that say to you today? <clears throat> if the straight message is being given, if the straight testimony is offered, and the straight testimony is then rejected. Who is being rejected? Are we the one being rejected or is God being rejected? Yeah, it's God. The princes of Judah had heard concerning the words of Jeremiah and came up from the king's house and sat in the entry of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, 
This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, and ye have heard with your ears. Would this be a forerunner of the Sunday law? But Jeremiah stood boldly before the princes and the people declaring, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city, all the words which ye have heard. <clears throat> Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I'm in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. But know ye for certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. When we are cast out, when stories are told about us, when our characters are being trampled upon, because we have stood, as did Jeremiah, alone before a multitude, giving the message that God gave to him. Are we not to praise God in all things? Are we not to praise him even when our very lives are being threatened? How do you see this? I'm in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. That's, you know. That's you're doing what you're doing. You're doing your what you believe. <laughs> In history, is there an example of another that stood before a multitude alone to give his testimony? And what did he say? In this situation, look also in the example given in the great controversy, not in the great hope, but in the great controversy. Here was Martin Luther. As he stood before the princes of the realm, his comment was, here I stand, I can do no other. How did Mrs. White record the testimony of Martin Luther? How did she record the testimony of William Miller? Are they not like this testimony of Jeremiah? <clears throat> Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. Jeremiah stood before them as a type of Christ. He gave a faithful warning. Had the prophet been intimidated by the threats of those in high authority and the clamoring of the rabble, his message would have been without effect and he would have lost his life. <clears throat> but the courage with which he discharged his painful duty 
commanded the respect of the people and turned the princes of Israel in his favor. Thus God raised up defenders for his servant. They reasoned with the priests and the false prophets, showing them how unwise would be the extreme measures which they advocated. Where are the extreme measures coming from? They're coming from the priests and the false prophets. Are they coming from the princes, the rulers? No. The extreme measures were coming from those of the church. <clears throat> the influence of these powerful persons produced a reaction in the minds of the people. Then the elders united in protesting against the decision of the priests regarding the fate of Jeremiah. They cited the case of Micah, who prophesied judgments upon Jerusalem, saying, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountains of the house as the high places of a forest. They put to them the question, did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord? and beseeched the Lord, and the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them, thus might we procure great evil against our souls. So through the pleading of Ahikam and others, the prophet Jeremiah's life was spared, although many of the priests and the false prophets would have been pleased had he been put to death on the plea of sedition, for they could not endure the truths that he uttered exposing their wickedness. <clears throat> Years later, another rabble supported by the priests sought to put another man to death because he spoke against Rome. But Israel remained unrepentant and the Lord saw that they must be punished for their sin. So he instructed Jeremiah to make yokes and bonds and place them upon his neck and send them to the king of Edom, to the king of Moab, of the Ammonites, of Tyrus, and Zidon. One, two, three, four, five. Commanding the messengers to say that God had given all these lands to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. That all these nations should serve him and his descendants for a certain time till God should deliver them. They were to declare that if those nations refused to serve the king of Babylon, they should be punished with famine, with the sword, and with pestilence, till they should be consumed. <clears throat> Therefore, said the Lord, hearken not ye to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you to remove you far from your land, and that I should drive you out, and ye should perish. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those I will let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell therein. Jeremiah declared that they were to wear the yoke of servitude for 70 years, and the captives that were already in the hands of the king of Babylon, and the vessels of the Lord's house, which had been taken, were also to remain in Babylon until that time had elapsed. But at the end of 70 years, God would deliver them from their captivity and would punish their oppressors and bring into subjection the proud king of Babylon. 
when do we see this prophecy being uttered? When would we accept this as having been given? What are you talking about? When was this given originally? Yeah. Uh, they'd been in captivity for a few years already. Right? Yeah. So they'd been in captivity. But would we not place this as, as occurring about 607 BC? No. This is okay. about 604. About 604. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so it's it's three years into the captivity already. Okay. Where stand, where do we stand today? We are now <clears throat> solidly two years after the message of warning of Nashville being publicly proclaimed throughout the world. A message of warning has been given. Have the church accepted this message? And has it accepted its great need of repentance? <clears throat> I would have to say no. If we in the movement are not willing to accept this message of our need of repentance, then we have a problem. Sister White says repentance is a daily, a daily thing. Exactly. But repentance is also a very personal thing. Right. Ambassadors had come from the various nations named to consult with the king of Judah as to the matter of engaging in battle with the king of Babylon. But the prophet of God, bearing the symbols of subjection, <coughs> delivered the message of the Lord to those nations, commanding them to bear it to their several kings. This was the lightest punishment that a merciful God could inflict upon so rebellious a people. But if they warred against this decree of servitude, if they were to feel, they were then to feel the full vigor of his chastisement, they were faithfully warned not to listen to their false teachers who prophesied lies. The amazement of the assembly. So, uh, correction. So, so in Jeremiah 25, this is when this, they talk about the 70 years of captivity. Right. So it's in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. So they would have been in captivity since the third year in the fall. And this is going to be in the fourth year. So they've been in captivity for about a year. Okay. Election so there. So you would, you would place this in about <clears throat> what, 602? No, no, no. This would this would be 606. 606. Yeah. So this is a year later. And when it says it's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to figure this out. It might be 605. Because um, it says it's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't become king um, until 605. And then he's his first reignal year begins in 604. So I was just looking at the six o, uh, the first year of Nebuchadnezzar thing, which is why I had six o four, but it, it must be six o five. Okay. So I, I kind of forgotten about this, how that works, and he also says it's um, from the thirteenth year of Josiah, 
the son of Ammon, uh, that is in the three and 20th year. So this is 23 years since he began his, his work as a prophet. Okay. Technically 22 years because it's the three and 20th. So it's the, he's talking ordinally. How do we see that symbol? How do we see this? 20, 22 is a symbol of restoration. Right. And what's, where would we apply 23? It's a symbol of the Day of Atonement. It's a symbol of the 2300 days. Right. So this message given in the 23rd year of Jeremiah, the symbol of the 2300 days, is this not as a bedrock for our faith. Just as the 2300 days is the central pillar of Adventism. How would you see this? <clears throat> the amazement of the assembled council of nations knew no bounds when Jeremiah, carrying the yoke of subjection around his neck, made known to them the will of God. But Hananiah, one of the false prophets against whom God had warned his people through Jeremiah, lifted up his voice in opposition to the prophecy declared. Wishing to gain the favor of the king and the court, he affirmed that God had given him words of encouragement for the Jews. Said he, within two full years, will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And I will bring them again to this place, and I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah, in the presence of all the priests and the people, said that it was the earnest wish of his heart that God would so favor his people that the vessels of the Lord's house might be returned and the captives brought back from Babylon. But this could only be done on condition that the people repented and turned from their evil way to the obedience of God's law. Jeremiah loved his country and ardently wished that the desolation predicted might be averted by the humiliation of the people. But he knew that the wish was vain. He hoped the punishment of the king of Israel, of Israel would be as light as possible. Therefore, he earnestly entreated them to submit to the king of Babylon for the time that the Lord specified. <clears throat> he entreated them to hear the words that he spoke. He cited them to the prophecies of Hosea, of Habakkuk, of Zephaniah and others whose messages of reproof and warning had been so similar to his own. He referred them to events which had transpired in their history in the fulfillment of the prophecies of retribution for unrepentant sins. Sometimes, as in this case, men had arisen in opposition to the message of God and predicted peace and prosperity to quiet the fears of the people, 
and to gain the favor of those in high places. But in every past instance, the judgment of God had been visited upon Israel, as the true prophets had indicated. Said he, the prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. If Israel chose to run the risk, future developments would effectively or effectually decide which was the false prophet. <clears throat> as we have again covered this example, as we again are seeing that the very warning of, Ze of Zephaniah is being tied with Jeremiah, with Habakkuk, and Hosea. Can we also not see that the very warning given by Sister White in 1905 regarding the destruction that will fall upon Nashville is soon to occur? There are those right now in the world that have settled for their own minds that this warning given by Sister White that was trumpeted again faithfully by Elder Jeff was that of a false message. Yet this destruction will occur. <clears throat> There will be those that will have the message of, Je of July 18th brought back to mind when this destruction does occur. The message that will need to be given when this happens will need to be given clearly, directly, without stutter, without fail. For it will indeed be the last message of mercy that will be given to this world. And the message of Hananiah occurs one year before Ezekiel begins his ministry because it's in the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign, and it's going to be in the fifth year that we're going to have this occur. So, so we have this false message that precedes the true. And have we not seen this in many other examples given throughout Scripture? That the false precedes the true? <clears throat> There are many that I have had as friends that are believing that the message of Revelation 14, that which we call righteousness by faith, is currently being given within the church. Yet many do not and have not understood this message. The message of righteousness by faith is going to go forward and it will be understood throughout the world so that the world can choose either for Christ or against him. There will not be another option. Is there any other thought or comment from what we have addressed today? Is there any other question that needs to be covered? Shall we then close with prayer?
Gracious Father in heaven, may it be that your warnings are not falling upon deaf ears. May it be that we are able to understand these messages as they relate to us individually <clears throat> and as they relate to us as a movement. Help us to be prepared. Direct us so that we may do that which is most necessary, so that others may hear these messages, be guided by them, so that your will is done. We thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your forbearance. That you are giving us time so that our minds may truly be opened. Be with us on this Sabbath day. Help us that we may understand in spirit and in truth that which we need to do to fully honor and keep your law. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen.